Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, the terminology is up for debate in the in, um, world, um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, we do record the shows every week, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's okay. You can always go to our website and watch our recordings afterwards. And at the end of today's show, I will show you where the website is and where all of our recordings are available to you. Um, we will include the recording of the show that goes onto our YouTube account. Um, if there are any presentations, slides, handouts, um, we include those or links to those as well. Um, and any websites that are mentioned, we collect into our delicious account so that you have access to those as well. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So if you see any topics coming up or any on our archives that you think may be of interest in any of your colleagues, friends, neighbors, family, anybody, uh, go ahead and send them to our website and they can um, watch the shows there. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, uh, demos of things. Uh, basically the only criteria we have it is that it is library related. Something libraries are doing, something they could be doing, something that might be of use to them. Um, that's really the only uh, criteria they have to meet. Some of our topics might seem a little out of the box. This one is obviously very obvious to libraries, but um, so, but you know, trust us, everything always comes around to having something to do with the libraries as we are the Nebraska Library Commission here. Um, we do have presentations and um, some shows that are specifically done by Nebraska Library Commission staff, things we're doing here, but we also bring in guest speakers <coughs> as we have this morning. Um, on the line with us from both here in Nebraska and all the way over on the East Coast um, is Amy Schindler, who's right from our University of Nebraska at Omaha, just north of where I am here in Lincoln. Hi, Amy. Good morning, Krista. Good morning. Um, and also, as you can see on the slide here, uh, Christian DuPont from Boston College. Good morning, Christian. Hello, Krista. Hello, world. <laughs> and Emily Hardman from Harvard University. Good morning. Thanks. Good morning. And I believe, I don't know about you guys, I know here and in Omaha it is snowing. How's it Tomorrow going on? for us. <laughs> oh, okay. You're good, okay, for today though. All right. <laughs> Um, and Amy contacted me about doing this session here today about the uh, change in these standards that they're doing for archives and special collections. And I will just hand over to you to explain exactly what's going on and what you guys have been working on and um, what you're looking for from, um, hopefully, from our attendees today. Okay, great. Thank you, Krista. Um, again, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to learn more about version two of the proposed standardized statistical measures and metrics for public services and archival repositories and special collections libraries. Uh, we're here this morning to share the current version of the proposed standard for public services measures with all of you, and hopefully hear from many of you with your questions and comments, either live today or by February 17th, which is the closing date for our comment period. Um, so I'm going to begin today by sharing background about the proposed standard, and then my task force co-chair, Christian, uh, will talk about the structure of the document, and task force member Emily will then take you on a deep dive of the proposed standard's reference, tractions, uh, reference transactions domain. And then we'll wrap up with comments, uh, both how to comment on the document and then hopefully also your comments um, and questions. So again, feel free to ask your questions as they come up during our presentation. So background, uh, the SAA, ACRL, RBMS Joint Task Force on the Development of Standardized Statistical Measures for Public Services and Archival Repositories and Special Collections Libraries was charged in 2014, and it's a mouthful. Uh, the task force consists of 10 members, five appointed by SAA and five appointed by ACRL, RBMS, and it includes two co-chairs representing each of the organizations. So the calls to develop standardized statistical measures for public services and archives and special collections goes back decades, with increasing interest in assessment in recent years. Uh, we can see this demand through sessions at our professional conferences, publications, as well as grant support initiatives aimed at fostering cultures of assessment and demonstrating the value that libraries and archives bring to our communities and society as a whole. Many of us have probably been asked in one way or another to demonstrate the value um, provided by our repository.
inventory, which should include qualitative and quantitative measures. For instance, you can share the story of a researcher who was able to get a building on the National Register of Historic Places using material from her repositories. And we um, can also want to share the amount of time that that researcher and our other researchers spent in our reading rooms last year. So getting back to the task force, uh, in 2015, we conducted a survey of community practice. And I just want to say again, a big thank you to the 313 repositories who responded. We know it was uh, not for the faint of heart, as one of our colleagues said. So thank you to everyone for your responses. Uh, version 2 of the draft document was released for comment in June 2016. And the task force was fortunate to receive um, a great deal of comments, both uh, live, um, at the ALA and SA annual meetings, and then also online and via emails. And so we're here today in part because we wanted another opportunity to share and receive live, feed, live feedback on version two. So version two of the draft document was released for comment uh, just last month, and that comment period will close February 17th, 2017, so next week. And then what will happen after next week, the task force will again get back to work, revising the document based on feedback we hear from all of you. Or if all of your feedback is, it looks great, go ahead, that would be fine, but we hope you have some comments for us. Then we'll submit the proposed standard to SA and ACRL RBMS. Uh, we're planning for April 2017. And then we wait, uh, hopefully, for the proposal to work its way through the standards committees and governing bodies of each organization. So we probably won't have a standard in place for your new fiscal year data collection this summer, but that doesn't mean you can't start using the draft document. And we know that some repositories already have. So this standard was developed to provide archivists and special collections librarians with a set of precisely defined practical measures. They've been based upon commonly accepted professional practices that can be used to establish local statistical data collection practices to support the assessment of public services and their operational impacts at your institution. We're not here to attempt to reduce the value of archives and special collections to a set of numerical inputs and outputs. We wish to establish a common and precise as possible vocabulary to facilitate conversations about the way in which archives and special collections deliver value and how we might increase it. Careful attention was given to creating the measures so that any type of repository that manages and provides access to archival and special collections holdings may use them. Also, they were formulated so that repositories of any size and any level of budgetary resource could implement the measures even if only the basic measures, which you'll hear about uh, more about in a couple minutes. Admittedly, though, um, so we do admit that some of these measures will be much easier to implement if you're using um, a digital tool and not just pen and paper to track your, uh, to track your data. Uh, the measures were also formulated to support the aggregation of public services data from multiple institutions to provide a basis for institutional comparisons um, and benchmarking. Um, this is something for the future, though. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that we are not the task force that's working on uh, holding counts and measures and primary source literacy. Those are two other joint ACRLS, uh, RBMS, SAA task forces that are also currently at work right now. And you can check their websites for more information on their current um, draft documents open for comment. Um, and then this here, this is just a list of our eight public services, proposed public services domains, I should say. Um, those of you who reviewed version one will note that version two has separated out instruction sessions by popular demand into its own domain. Um, it still shares a lot in common with events and exhibitions, but it is, it is on its own now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christian. Thank you, Amy. And again, thank you for all of you. We are now up to what, uh, Krista? How many uh, attendees? 120, I'm uh, saying. It's 120 logins, um, but I have had some notes from people that there may be groups listening as well. So as far as number of people, we won't know. I'm not exactly sure, but 120 uh, individual logins, yes. That's great, and you know, thank you, you know, all of you taking some time out of the you know the day to to uh, to engage with this effort here, and uh, obviously many of you um, have already responded to our earlier survey. Um, some of you, this is a, a brand new thing, though, and maybe you are a practicing archivist or special collections librarian. Maybe you're an assessment librarian at your institution or administrator. Um, we thank you for joining us because, in fact, you know, this really is a brand new effort. There have not been any. Um, back to the last slide, actually. 
Oh, okay. Um, okay. I'll go walk through the domains a little bit. A standard that has defined in the domain of um, special collections and archives um, the, the, the specific measures. There's been no common vocabulary, no common measures. Um, and we're aware that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of paradoxical, the fact that uh, we're all more focused on, you know, demonstrating value and assessment these days. Uh, and yet some of the annual surveys that we participate in have actually kind of cut out uh, the sections that have to do with special collections and archives. So, uh, so in fact, our effort here is to kind of, you know, complement um, the, the kind of statistical surveys that we uh, perform for our own institutions um, and uh, for aggregated surveys that we may participate in and to uh, enable us and those who look at what we are doing in special collections and archives um, to be able to have these, again, common measures and vocabulary so that, uh, so that, again, we can really bring special collections archives into this larger assessment uh, conversation and uh, this conversation about the value that migrated archives um, you know, bring uh, to our users. So what are the public services domain? Let's, let's get that uh, vocabulary straight here first. So um, as a response to our surveys and we kind of thought about how we could really cluster things together, we, we define what we call these eight domains of uh, public services measures uh, that we'll be getting into. So uh, user demographics, we all uh, tend to collect information about who is using our archives and special collections, particularly those uh, researchers who come and register to, uh, to use our materials on site in a reading room setting. Um, some of our researchers are coming to us, uh, uh, you know, via email reference transactions, phone calls. Uh, that's an activity that we have in common, special collections and archives with, uh, with libraries in general. Um, meeting room visits, uh, again, people who come on site to, uh, to use our materials. Uh, and yes, using those materials, actually counting uh, how those materials are used in, in, uh, in different ways. Um, we also, as libraries, uh, archival special collections, repositories, uh, often host events, uh, maybe lectures. Um, uh, we want to, uh, to be able to provide some common vocabulary and, uh, for tracking those types of uh, uh, public events that we do. Uh, a lot of us these days are focused on instructional outreach, uh, whether we're part of a campus community or maybe even a historical society that's serving um, K-12 um, students in, in, uh, in the area. Um, so uh, instructions, uh, sessions are a special type of event, but because they have their distinct quality, we separated those into a separate domain uh, for statistical measures. Um, we also tend to produce a lot of exhibitions, uh, both physical exhibitions, people coming into our, our repositories to see a uh, curated display of some of our items, um, and then uh, many of us are also uh, putting exhibitions online. So we develop some, uh, some measures and metrics to, um, uh, to help repositories describe their activities in, in, in producing physical and online exhibitions. Uh, and then there's the general category of just online interactions. Uh, you know, how many people are visiting our websites uh, or sections thereof. Uh, a lot of us are doing a lot more on social media these days. So how do we quantify uh, that activity? So again, our standard here provides uh, some definitions and guidelines for that. Okay, now let's roll to the next slide here, please. Common vocabulary, as, as Amy said. Uh, because our goal really is to create a standard that complements other standards and statistical surveys that, are, that, uh, that we are asked to respond to. Uh, we have, in every case possible, uh, borrowed uh, or adapted our definitions you know, from other standards. So uh, from other statistical surveys, uh, from the standards, uh, international standards, for instance, that inform those. For instance, we're all familiar with maybe Z3950 as a connection protocol for library catalogs, while the Z39.7 uh, ANSI and ISO uh, protocol is about information services and use metrics and statistics for libraries and information providers, a data dictionary. We draw from that, from ISO 2789, from this uh, Society of American Archivists uh, glossary. So the idea being that, again, we're trying to um, uh, to work with, with common definitions so that, uh, that we are really speaking the same language. In, in a very few cases, though, we did have to devise our own uh, definitions. Uh, the most interesting of this uh, that I'll mention here, because it might come into our discussion later, uh, is what we call a collection unit. Um, something that's special about special collections and archives is we hold material in various formats. Um, so not just books or rare books, uh, boxes of archival documents, maps, um, drawings, uh, artifacts, 
So, and we all tend to manage those a little bit differently as how we issue them to our readers in a reading room or maybe um, uh, track how many items we pulled for a class. So this is an, uh, an example of how we said we don't want to change uh, the practice of archival repositories uh, by imposing a standard on them. We want them to follow their normal operation, what works for them, and enable them a systematic way of counting things. So whether you circulate uh, or check out to a reader in a reading room, you know, one folder at a time from our box or a whole box uh, or two volumes at a time and just instead of just one, uh, we would call that a collection unit, the way uh, the material is checked out uh, to a user. So that's an example of you won't find collection unit in any other library standard. You'll find it in ours, but we give it a rationale um, that helps it make sense in the context of other standards that we employ. Um, and that's where the other part of our definition section, which is a glossary and appendix at the end of the long uh, standards document, includes you know, our sources and comments on why we uh, chose the definitions that we have, a thesaurus to relate to other terms. Uh, and then, uh, as you'll see, and as, as Emily walks us through actually an example domain here on reference transactions, you'll see where specific terms that we have um, um, defined in our glossary are capitalized in context, so you can refer to those. Um, again, in precise ways as you use the standards. Okay, well, the next slide, please. So, uh, going back to the domains, right, we have eight public services domains. Uh, we have given them each the same modular structure uh, so that uh, you can really uh, work in the standard at a, at a, uh, on a specific area and then kind of telescope out and, and, uh, and work with different sections there. So, it has, uh, it's a very long document. There are, some of you looked at it already, I hope, you know, some 60, 70 pages. Uh, but because that is a common structure, uh, we hope it will be easy for you to navigate. And yes, uh, one comment received already, we will be numbering all the sections. So, it will be easier to navigate the document that way in its final version. Uh, but in terms of its basic DNA, if you will, uh, each domain, we give an overview. What is, what are we talking about when we say online interactions? Uh, and then we propose for each domain one basic measure. Uh, that we expect uh, every repository, um, no matter how large, how small, how well funded or not, whether it's using paper and pencil to tally uh, statistics or using uh, an electronic system, a basic measure that every repository can, can keep and that has meaning um, in that domain. So we provide a rationale for that basic measure um, and then we give some very specific guidelines for collection, how to count. Um, and then if those guidelines aren't clear enough, we even give you some applications and examples so you can really check to say, yes, okay, we are counting it in a way that's going to be compatible. Uh, because as Amy mentioned, one goal here is that we, we could have a statistical survey of special collections uh, and archival repository on some you know, national scale even that we could aggregate statistics and compare them. So we do want to be able to compare those apples with apples. So we want to help, help institutions uh, collect those statistics in very consistent uh, and precise ways. Um, so basic measures and then advanced measures are those uh, other uh, uh, types of measures that uh, would apply in a, in a, in a, in a domain area. Um, but uh, we don't expect every institution to collect all of them. Uh, in fact, if you tried to collect all of the you know, three or four dozen statistics uh, that we suggest here, you would probably spend a good deal of time tracking things. So we suggest areas that would be useful uh, to assess different types of activity and to give rationale uh, for those and guidelines for collection. Uh, I, Emily's uh, example next year will help to really clarify the distinction between basic and advanced measures and how you might apply them. The other concept that we'll introduce you here are metrics. Um, and we also provide a series of suggested uh, we say recommended metrics that might help you assess your performance and service delivery in that area. What do we mean by metrics and, and measures? So next slide. Uh, so a measure is simply the result of taking a measurement of some quantifiable object or process, right? So how many people visited your repository? That's a simple measure. How many collection units did you issue to readers in a reading room? A simple measure. A metric uh, is a calculated ratio between measures or maybe an independent variable like time. So how many researchers per month have come in? Or an interesting metric might be that maybe you've never thought of, how many collection units does a researcher look at on average, you know, when he or she comes to the reading room? You know, has that changed as we've implemented a policy that allows people, say, to bring in their digital camera and start photographing things in, in our reading rooms instead of having to, uh, you know, to read them and take notes uh, right there on the spot? So those are the examples of the kinds of, uh, again, measures and then metrics that we 
uh, we work with as concepts in our document. A couple more concepts, and this will be my last slide. Inputs, outputs, value, and assessment, right? We're all trying to get to uh, some sort of assessment of what we're doing here. But uh, let's back up and, and clarify that with our statistical standard, and again, it is a, it is a quantitative and not qualitative standard. We are counting uh, service transactions, interactions. We are counting both inputs, so resources that we allocate to a service, uh, an example of that, uh, Amy alluded earlier when, with that example of a researcher who comes in and, and uh, or engages with staff on a reference question that leads to getting a, a building registered as a historical monument. And she said, how much time is the staff spending on that activity of answering a reference question? That's an example of a staff input. And we do have measures um, throughout our document in different domains that uh, precisely uh, help you to, to, to tally and to, uh, to track the amount of time input that you are putting into a particular service. Uh, the outputs are the service transactions themselves. We're not always uh, uh, used to thinking in special collections and archives about what we're doing as a kind of transactional nature. We tend to you know, so focus on a researcher that everything is sort of a one-off special thing that we do. But in fact, you know, when we answer a reference question for one person or another, that's a transaction. It's a repeated uh, service cycle. Um, and those are the outputs that we're going to be counting. So inputs, outputs. Um, the concept that we often work with now in assessment is really value, and that's really from the user's perspective. What benefit does this service have to the user you know, in answering a reference question? What did that do for me? Um, well, it helped me to, to get that building on the register. I couldn't have done it without that. That's a user story that, again, won't come directly from you know, the, the statistics there, counting how much time or how many service transactions we did. Um, but, uh, but by at least building uh, some consistent vocabulary and ways of counting the things that we're doing, uh, we're building a basis for uh, repositories to then approach um, uh, really value assessment and maybe combine these quantitative measures uh, with some qualitative um, assessments as well. Uh, but even with what we're doing here, purely numbers, we can get at a lot of really meaningful assessment data. Um, operational efficiency, you know? Um, how good are we? Should we be training ourselves to more efficiently answer reference questions or distributed, you know, um, how they're handled by different staff? Um, how quickly are we getting materials retrieved? These are operational efficiency and they have a bottom line impact on our operation and our staffing. Service effectiveness, too. Numbers can tell us stories there. You know, uh, when people submit a, uh, a, a reproduction order, they'd like to have something digitized. Um, you know, are we getting it done within a certain amount of time? Are we getting it done at all? Uh, that's an effect of this measure that, um, that analyzing our outputs can really tell us. And from there, we can begin to tell those stories again of impact and value. So um, again, those are the concepts that we're working with in statistical standard. And uh, Emily now will really take us into a deep dive that will um, explain uh, in context how this works with reference transactions. Okay, great. Thanks, Christian. Um, so yeah, what we really wanted to do was show you just a kind of um, focused piece of the standard. Um, I don't think that Amy or Christian mentioned this, but the document itself, if you've taken a quick look at it, is actually something like 80 pages long. Um, and we know that it's not a gripping cover-to-cover -cover kind of read, um, but we made it that long because we really tried to fill it with the substance that will allow you to use it in a, in a really functional way and provide a lot of the answers that you might kind of um, need as you're wondering about how to apply this stuff in the in the real world and we are working as a group toward um, some other kind of product that will be a little bit more of a kind of quick reference um, item that will help you sort of be working with it without flipping through all of those pages but we wanted to take one of these areas um, in our domain and really show you, walk you through all of the, the information that we've provided, all of the kind of direction and support that we hope we've built in to the standard. And so this will um, both sort of show you specific details about our domain of reference transactions and serve as a model for what you might expect to encounter in these other domain areas. Um, so hopefully this will help raise some questions that you might have about um, the utility of things we've provided um, or some, some suggestions or support for how we've laid out um, the structure of the standard. So let's look at the, the reference transaction uh, domain. 
as we do in each of the domain areas, we begin with a definition that tries to pull together a lot of the different concepts that um, we work with in public services on that kind of daily basis. So the way that we've just pulled together the existing uh, definitions and um, kind of repurposed them for this standard is to say that a reference transaction is often the most common interaction between the repository staff and users. So we have staff engaging with users to learn about their research interests and really thinking about how we use the resources of our repositories to respond to queries and to researcher user needs. Um, and we mentioned here also, um, this sort of fills out the, the kind of conversation we might have around what does a reference transaction mean, and this is a, another common thread that we see in our defining work throughout the standard. We um, sort of offer this uh, additional element to the definition, um, which is that reference transactions provide opportunities for staff to hear and gather stories from users about the impact that archives and special collections have on people's lives. So that kind of goes to what Christian was just talking about in terms of how we're looking at what the, the outcomes of using the standard might provide us. Um, so we can go to the next one, Amy, great. Um, for all of our domain areas, we begin with a basic measure. And the idea here is that this is something that anyone in any kind of institution can collect and can report. Um, Amy mentioned at the beginning the survey that we did of our colleagues um, back in uh, 2015. And that was something where we really were kind of looking at a huge range of practices. And we used that to guide our thinking very specifically about these basic measures. Um, and we kind of checked back with that data and made sure that, yes, indeed, these are things that anybody should be able to, to capture. Um, so in this case, our basic measure for a reference transaction um, is the number of reference questions that are received from users. And that is regardless of the method that the user uses to submit the question. Um, we provide a rationale, as Christian mentioned, for every kind of measure that we suggest you collect. Um, so this is a way both of communicating directly to you if you don't kind of buy um, the it on its face that this is a useful thing to collect. This is our way of sort of offering some argument about why you might want to um, or opening up some new kind of considerations um, for a repository or for um, administrative staff who, who might be sort of wondering about why we would want this data and what we might do with it. So in this case, our rationale for the basic measure of reference questions is uh, to say that maintaining this count is actually kind of our core way of tracking a core staff engagement with users. Um, you know, we say this is the, the most basic, um, and we, we think that that is just because it is such a, a fundamental function of public services and that this is a good way of reflecting that. It's not that we're saying this is the only kind of way um, that our staff's work is, is represented, but this is a core and basic way. You can go to the next, Amy. Sorry, froze there. Okay. Oops. Oh, I think we. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the next area in our domain for reference transaction is actually the provision of these guidelines for collection, um, and this is one of those places where we start to see why this is an 80-page document <laughs> because there are lots of different ways of collecting data, lots of different kinds of ideas that people might very reasonably have about what counts or how to count. Um, and as we said, the our idea here is really to make apples be apples across repositories. So we've provided a lot of instruction about how to capture this data um, and how to put some parameters around um, our counts for things so that we can be moving toward a place where we have at least some sense that um, we are comparing the same kind of information. Um, so for this basic measure of the reference questions, um, what we suggest is that counting reference questions um, concerning different topics from the same individual uh, actually are two different questions. Um, 
so that's a, a way of, of sort of helping people not lump all of the questions that might come from a single user into a, a one count, a one tick mark. I was saying when you're following different strings of logic or questions or um, maybe consultation of materials for a user, that becomes something separate that we count. Um, and that builds into our kind of basic uh, tabulation for the number of reference questions that we're getting. Um, we also suggest that we exclude follow-up emails, multiple social media interactions, or other conversations on the same question. So right, that's a logical kind of extension from our first point, which is that if the same person asks a different substantive question, those are two different questions. Same idea here, going in a different direction. The same individual asks, uh, questions that build on the same initial question um, that flesh out maybe what they've come to us initially for, that becomes, that remains one single question. We also specify that you exclude directional or general information questions. So when do you have your tour? Um, can I have an instruction session where the restroom is that kind of thing? Um, doesn't count in this um, in this reckoning. Um, we also exclude requests from users to um, get new material while they're working in a reading room. Um, that, is, that is not a reference question if you ask, um, you know, where is my next box? Um, so again, that's just to really provide some, some uh, immense clarity around how to capture these metrics. Um, we also suggest that we count questions from users working in the reading room if the response requires staff to employ their knowledge around um, one or more information sources and that user hasn't already asked that question. So this is a recognition that sometimes reference questions come up in the course of our patrons work in a reading room, um, but that it, it may be a, a sort of separate inquiry. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, you'll see also our um, sort of understanding or, or nod to a particular kind of practice that you might engage in, um, which is basically sampling. Um, and we understand and uh, sort of accept as, as perfectly valid the, the practice of sampling to collect this measure, um, as well as uh, keeping a kind of consistent tally as one moves through the, the course of the, of the year or the reporting period, whatever that may be. Okay. So as Christian mentioned, we also try to flesh out our guidelines for collection with examples. Um, and this is an example of some of the examples that we provide here. So these are little user and staff stories um, that we think might help people understand um, how these things might play out and what, what to do in terms of establishing that metric in the real world. Um, so for example, a, a user and a staff member exchange multiple emails about the same research topic. That's one of those cases where the repository should count it only as a single reference question. Um, but we indicate that you may wish to apply a, a higher complexity level to that transaction. Um, so that's where we get into our advanced measures. Um, basic measure, we're counting each reference question, um, but there are ways of extending that, and that becomes um, into play when one consults our advanced measures area, which we can look at now. Um, so just kind of quickly show you some of the, the advanced measures to, again, give you a little bit of flavor here. Um, in this case, one uh, thing Emily, can I jump in for a sec? Yeah. I, we do course. have one question about, um, I think it's on the previous slide, or what you were originally talking about. Um, someone wants to, is asking, are follow-up questions, would follow-up questions be counted if they send you into a different collection? Like, I does that then make it become something new? A new yeah, I think question. what we, the way that I would interpret that, and I'll, I'll look uh, virtually at my um, you know, task force members here, I, I think that the way that we indicate um, how you would proceed in that case is, is the substance of the question different? So mm -hmm. collections, okay. you know, might take numerous kinds of of consultations of different materials or collections to answer a question that still is at core the same question um, but if the substance of the question 
shifts became um, into something yeah. new. So we're really exactly. talking about if the whole topic suddenly they decide, oh wait, that is what I really meant. What wanted to know about was this, and it's completely different from the first thing. Then you've got two. Yeah, or a new kind of um, you know research rabbit hole that comes up <laughs> as someone sort of in the field, and they say, oh, this has really opened up a kind of new area of mm -hmm. concern for me, and I want to look a little bit over here. Can you help right. me with that too? Right. Awesome. This, is, right, thank this you. is Amy, if I can just jump in too, mm -hmm. where that, um, the fact that you're accessing one or two or, or many more collections to answer the same question, um, that would be captured under the collection use domain. Mm -hmm. um, True. So that, that effort, if you will, is, is partially captured, documented there. And Christian, I'll uh, just jump in here with one more comment too. And this is a, a good discussion, an example of where while we want our standard to be normative and to provide some clear definitions about what to count and what not to count, um, at the same time we recognize as a measure of local, local policy that has to apply here, how to do this practically. So mm -hmm. the, the main thing that we want to help uh, repositories to do is to think about uh, an area of activity like reference transactions um, and then to, to think and extrapolate even their more local policies about this. So let's say an institution is using a reference tracking system, okay, like a help desk software kind of thing, or even a spreadsheet. There may be a point where you're answering the question, you said, okay, this is now a different question, and I'm going to start a new conversation thread, okay? Um, the way that if you're using a reference tracking system that you're going to count in the end is you're probably going to run a report from that software, okay? So as long as you have a local policy and just your judgment that's saying, okay, when do we break off and make this a new question, when you run that report at the end, it's going to have some consistency to it and that's going to be your count. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you are, you know, the, lo the, the loan arranger or there are two of you in, a, in an office, you'll just, and you're, and you're, and you're making tick marks on a paper of how many reference questions, again, as long as there's some kind of consistent understanding about how you're handling things, that's the main thing. So that if we do, you know, have an effort to aggregate statistics over time, at least your repository will be, you know, um, reporting information consistently. And even for your own operational use internally, as you evaluate from, you know, from month to month to year to year, you'll know what you mean. It's got to be meaningful for you. That's, that's the, the judgment question we want to leave you with, and we explain a little bit more in the introduction to the whole document. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's a really important point that the this this guideline is in standard is meant to sort of help uh, provide as much clarity as it can. But we all know on the ground, you know, things happen in different ways for all of us. Um, so we're hoping that this will provide some structure and some sense of an internal kind of coherent means of collecting this data, so that even as you have sort of staff maybe changing over time, um, your practices become um, sort of embodied in, the, in these particular ways and, and you are providing a, a consistent kind of um, way of counting. Mm -hmm. um, we do have another question from someone else about the directional questions that you had mentioned that they want to know why are, the specific question is why are directional questions not counted if they come detailed? Which I suppose could be, mean, the question could mean can they, turn into something that then gets counted? Maybe they started as directional but developed into something else? This is Christian. May I jump in with a quick answer and let others follow? Sure. Um, one point I wanted to, to, you know, to make here is that this is, because I was the one speaking about definitions, right? Mm -hmm. So the definition that we have adapted in this case for a reference transaction is a very common one. That's the one that appears in the international standards there. That's E39.7 and, you know, ISO 2789 that I was talking about earlier, okay? And, you know, and, and that applies to library statistical surveys. So just like everybody else, okay, we exclude those, okay? So you read other statistical surveys. Those are the instructions that are given. Is that directional, you know, where's the bathroom? Is not a reference question. It has to reference question has to include, use the knowledge of the librarian about the uh, collections and uh, some information source, um, whether that's memorized by the librarian or something that we check up. So, so this is something that actually corresponds to other, um, you know, uh, survey and, 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 and standards for, for defining reference questions and, and collecting statistical information about them. This, this is Amy, um, if I can just add to that in a, as an example that we deal with, you know, often we'll have students walk in our front door and say, what is this place? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, you know, our frontline staff says, well, you're in archives and special collections, and they'll say a sentence or two about 
who we are, what we do. And sometimes the student will leave, but sometimes they will stay. And then they're asking more substantive follow-up questions about, oh, tell me about those congressional collections or the university history. And so at that point, then it becomes um, a reference question, a transaction that we're documenting, that we're counting. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, yeah. Someone else says it may not be a reference question, but it does take time, and it's a customer service question. And that's where likely we had that, you know, a, a, a specific guideline there that was on the previous slide about, you know, when the researcher comes up to the reference desk and says, "May I have my next box, please?" Okay, that's not a reference question. We're not using, you know, information about the collection, you know, and, and answering a substantive content-related question. It's you know, I just need my next mm -hmm. material. So, um, yeah, that's something that's peculiar to special collections and archives. You wouldn't have it at a general reference desk, um, you know, in a library. But um, so that's the kind of again example we extrapolate. The principle is you got to have you know the knowledge of the professional or the staff member, and you know, or consulting an information resource in order to have a reference question. Um, so therefore, we give very specific examples of things to include or exclude based on those principles. All right, thank you. Go ahead. So do we have any more questions or does that make sense? I don't know if we get uh, um, any kind of feedback of have we answered it fully? Do you need yeah, any more? Does that make sense? Anyone can say if you need more information or not. Yeah. The other thing we have is a comment someone wants to know is, so they say great work about the whole document you've got here, um, the whole standard. Um, they want to know after it's completed or if you don't already have one of these, could you reduce it to a one or two page at most cheat sheet? Otherwise, I'm yeah. afraid staff will neither use nor reference an 80 page standard. <laughs> That's what I was saying at the, at the kind of beginning of the of this deeper dive into the, the reference transaction um, the section, which is that, right, we probably will spin out um, a document that will be useful in that kind of day-to-day -day way. Um, that will be much, much shorter, as well as some kind of um, shorter executive summary sort of thing with a little more um, narrative element. You know, so there might be something that's very like functional, kind of tool-based um, uh, uh, product that we that we put out, and as well as this um, more narrative kind of distillation of these ideas. Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead and continue. Um, so just okay. Great. So um, I'll just uh, sort of put a spotlight on um, some elements of the advanced measure, just by showing you kind of one example of how we're taking that basic uh, level that we think everyone can respond to and, and saying, here are some ways to build on this. Um, so one of the, the advanced measures is this question method. Um, and that captures and categorizes the methods by which we receive reference questions. Um, so in our tally for that basic measure, it's just is there one or isn't there one? So it counts as one or it doesn't. Um, in this uh, advanced uh, way of, of looking at how we might extend some of our, our data collection, we're thinking about um, capturing also the, the ways in which we are receiving um, reference questions. So is that by email? Is it by phone? Is it in person? Is it by telegram, um, carrier pigeon, whatever whatever it is? Um, and we're thinking um, that in this case, the, the rationale is um, that it shows how our users prefer to interact with us. So especially as we look at this over time, so this is one of those cases where a snapshot may or may not be useful. Um, you know, the fact that we're getting more phone calls in this uh, week uh, or more emails in the next week might not tell us much, but certainly over time, especially if we start to see shifts in how people are interacting with us, maybe we're getting more um, kind of chat reference questions. Could something like that happen? Um, those trends show us really some ways into staffing and to tailoring the sorts of services that we might provide, maybe even give us some pointers for staff um, development or training. Do we need to be able to build up more special collections librarians who can do that kind of uh, chat reference with, with something like that work? Um, and then the way that we deal with the advanced measures is uh, um, by continuing, as I showed you in the basic measure, by providing those guidelines for collections um, and the sort of uh, skit sort of scenario um, of examples of how we might do this count. 
um, in the reference domain, we have a couple more advanced measures that we suggest. So that's time spent in the responding. Um, that can be a tricky one maybe to encourage your, your staff to do. That's certainly one of those weird little quirks of life that accounting for the time that you spend on something actually takes a lot of time. So frustrating, um, true, truism. Um, but that could be really useful and could show us a little bit, um, again, on the kind of staffing and the, the, the value questions that we might have. Um, we could also track question purpose, so defining the the sort of um, purpose of a, a question or service request that we get, um, and we suggest that that is maybe best done in response to a, a defined rubric. Um, and also the question complexity, again, this is something that is best determined by um, some kind of rubric or scale so that we can place it along a, a continuum of complexity. Go to the next slide, um, and we kind of um, wrap up our our section by looking at these re recommended metrics. So at the beginning, Christian flushed out the difference between uh, the measures and metrics, um, and here's where we're taking things from that flat number into something that shows us more meaningful uh, trends. Um, so here we're looking at the total number of reference questions that are received in the, the week or month. So that's taking our number and looking at it across a period of time. Um, and uh, as we sort of suggest in the standard, you know, that shows us some of the, the patterns of the, the life of our institution, perhaps. Um, and we can go on. I'll just run through these metrics that we suggest. The total number of reference questions received um, via each method. So is there some kind of pattern to that? Do we um, know that there's more email uh, transactions uh, referenced at certain times of year? Does that show us the way a particular constituency might like to communicate with us? Um, those things that we can start to do some uh, analytic work in our own institutional context to try to understand better. Um, we can go to the next one. Uh, and these are just the, the final metrics that it won't take um, our time in going through in detail, um, but the average number of minutes spent responding to reference questions, the average number of minutes spent responding to maybe an internal versus an external um, user group, um, the ratio of time responding to reference questions uh, to users, um, time spent in a reading room, so <laughs> that, that could be a kind of fascinating uh, metric to have and to explore and to think about some of our um, ways that we just deploy our, our service and our staffing. Um, also the ratio of reference questions submitted by users in each of the demographic categories. So here you're seeing um, the way that we're sort of pulling together the different threads on our standard and that suggesting how they might help illuminate um, these different areas when we look at some of the data put together in these um, different ways. Um, we can go to the, the next, Amy, and I think that's over to you, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just wrap up really quickly here and hopefully we have some more questions. So we just wanted to provide the list of all of the domains and show the basic and advanced measures for each of the domains. Um, so one thing you'll notice here is that, um, you know, every domain has, as, as we said before, one basic measure and then the number of advanced measures does certainly vary by domain from one for reading room visits to many for the collection use uh, domain, which uh, I had to stretch onto a second page there you see. Um, and you'll also notice again that the, the instruction and events domains, they do, um, uh, you know, they're counting a lot of the same sort of information, but they have been separated out. And then finally, um, the exhibitions and online interaction domains and their measures. So I um, just want to wrap up again and say um, we really appreciate all of your comments that you can give us today <laughs> or through next Friday. Um, and these comments are open to everyone. You don't have to be an RBMS member or an SA member uh, to make the comments by email or on the websites. Um, so to submit your comments, you can go to the RBMS website and um, it uses a plugin, Degresset, to allow you to basically make your comments sort of in line in the paragraphs. Um, on the SA website, you're 
basically going to comment as you would on a blog post. You go to the bottom of the page and um, you have to log in. If you don't have an SA account, you'll be um, prompted to create one. Um, so again, it's open to anyone. And then of course you can always just email uh, your comments to Christian and I, um, and we, we welcome those. Uh, a quick word about um, kind of for the future, um, and some of what is not in this document. Um, at this point, we cannot guarantee uh, the creation of a statistical survey instrument to collect your institutional statistics. But we have been in contact with a couple of vendors to ensure they're aware of this project. So that isn't something um, that we can guarantee we'll be able to release. And unfortunately, a shared uh, national data repository will not be rolled out at the same time um, of the standards approval. Uh, as has been noted, the document no, uh, notes a number of areas where specific types of repositories may wish to come together and add further definition to a measure. For example, repositories may wish to define specific user classifications based on whether they are a public library or an academic institution, a corporate archives, etc. This document uh, does not attempt to provide guidance on conducting qualitative assessments of user impacts, uh, which are beyond our scope. And then finally, these measures were not created to stand in for budgetary inputs and outputs. They could be used to support a cost-benefit analysis of service operations, but they are not set up to automatically do so. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us this morning, and we're happy to take more questions. Um, if there's no questions, I can certainly show you the commenting options on the SA RBMS websites. Uh, thank you, Amy, Christian, and Emily. Yes, we do have one question that just came in here at the end. Um, let's see. All right, if we can get this question. We are always looking to translate user demand and use stats to inform additional processing and digitization decisions. Can you talk about how these measures will address this need? Uh, this is Christian, just to, to read and make sure I uh, understand it. Uh, it's, it's correlating, essentially, um, use of materials and then how those uh, prioritizing, perhaps, for digitization. Would you mind reading the question just one more time? Sure, no problem. Sorry. Uh, we're always looking to translate user demand and use stats to inform additional processing and digitization decisions. Can you talk about how these measures will address this need? So translating user demand and use to processing and other decisions. Right. So to really, you know, decide what needs to be digitized, you not only need to count how many t things are being used, but also keep track of what is being used. Um, so this is another aspect um, that's useful to bring out here is that in defining a statistical standard, our focus is with those basic measures on simply counting um, and what information you capture uh, is going to depend a lot on the local method you use to, to do that counting. So again, our definition, and to come back to collection unit, you know, you're, you're taking a box of archival material, you're issuing it to read in the reading room, and the reader comes back to you and says, I would like to have, you know, um, material digitized from this, um, this collection, or it would be great if you would digitize the whole box sort of thing, okay? Now, if you're just keeping your statistics on, you know, tally sheet, you know, um, how many um, boxes were requested, or you're counting call slips to say at the end of the month we had, you know, so many call slips for, uh, for boxes of archival materials, rare books, what have you, um, you wouldn't be able to correlate and to say, oh, it was that collection and that box that people have been repeatedly asking for to be digitized. You know, if you're using a, um, maybe a, an automated system where you're tracking call slips and, and that sort of thing, then, uh, then you might have access to that information that would, uh, would say, oh, yes, you know, we can, we can flag things that people request for digitization or from which they have already requested individual items and say, we really ought to go back then and digitize, um, you know, that whole box of material because people keep requesting things from it. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope that's helpful. I'm, you know, happy to take a follow-up from the same person who was asking the question if that kind of gets at what we're able to accomplish with the statistical standard and the dependency upon the local method you're using to capture statistics and, and how rich that data is. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. Um, yeah, if you need any more um, clarification, let us know. Um, the questioner there. Um, we have another question. 
Uh, someone says they're unclear about the user association measure. Is this asking for just affiliated users or affiliated and unaffiliated users? So the user association there measure. Yeah. Pull that up. There we go. Again, okay. So for our basic measure, um, this is really hard. We spent a lot of time talking, <laughs> you know, what do we want to count for kind of user demographics? Um, and because we're trying to address so many different types of institutions, it just happens that all three of us on the phone today work, you know, uh, with academic libraries, special collections unit within academic libraries. We have other people on our task force who are corporate archivists, who work in, um, you know, public library settings, what have you. They're, they're just different settings, okay, that we're trying to address all of them, right? historical societies. So one of the th criteria that kind of came to us as a very basic measure was that there are, um, like in the case of an academic institution, there are people who are affiliated with your institution. They're students, they're faculty members, okay? Um, and we, it's interesting for us to think about, you know, in terms of our mission, uh, you know, how much of our effort, how many of our users are coming to us from our campus community versus those who are coming to us from, you know, around the region, around the world. Um, you know, same thing, uh, you know, historical society, how many people are coming in within certain, um, who are members of our institutions, who are friends of, um, pick a local one, Longfellow House here, okay? Um, and how are they using the repository versus other people who are not members of an organization, you see? So that's, that's what we're, we're, we're coming up with as a basic measure. And we think it's an interesting one for all institutions um, to take into account. That's why we recommend it as a basic measure. Um, whereas, so it's the association with the institution that we're capturing there. Whereas if you go to the next page, it's kind of the affiliation of the user with other organizations. It may be your own, but it may be other organizations, okay? So, you know, uh, you have researchers coming in. How many of them are professional researchers? You know, they're, they're, they're PhD, graduate student, faculty, um, you know, researchers versus members of the general public versus a K-12 student. Those are the kinds of affiliations that we're uh, suggesting would be useful as an advanced measure to capture um, in terms of user demographics. Anyone else want to add something to that? That's the basic distinction there and rationale for our basic measure. No? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, all right, and now we have another question that's come in. If anybody does have any questions, just a reminder, use your question section of your GoToWebinar interface to type them in. Um, I did notice it did just hit 11 a.m. Central Time here on my clock, but um, we'll go as long as it takes to get through all the present, all the, any questions you may have. Um, we don't get cut off from this system or anything, so um, feel free to stick around and ask your questions as you want to, as long as these guys are willing to stick around um, to answer a few. We might only go to like at the longest, maybe quarter after. We don't want to hold people up too much, um, but don't worry about that. If you do have questions, type them in and we will grab them for you. Um, so we have a new one here. Uh, question regarding counting reference transactions. Currently, different curators may get the same question from a patron and our current system they are counted separately if multiple people work on the same question sometimes unknowingly where would the total time spent go or would it be kept separately for each curator yeah this actually came up at midwinter too I think maybe a lot of us have problems with uh, people <laughs> submitting questions to multiple folks on staff um, and, and it is a, a little bit tricky I think we made a note that we would kind of come back to this question um, about you know, uh, again, as, as Christian sort of said earlier, like there's a local practice element here that we can't make good recommendations around, but um, mm -hmm. you know, certainly this seems to be a pretty big um, widespread problem. In terms of the, the, the time though, um, this may depend on your, your tool, um, but the, the time spent recording, uh, responding to a, a question, some of them can be recorded from you know, multiple staff members in one tool, and, and that time is the time, regardless of how many people have kind of contributed their minutes or hours to it. Yeah, so I mean, this is where actually, if you, you know, some repositories that we worked for when they re responded to our initial statistical uh, survey of practices found out that they weren't tracking these sorts of things at all. And it sounds like at your institution where you, you know, are asking the question from, you, you are, you know, <laughs> tracking this and you're finding that as a result of tracking, 
you actually have a problem. I mean, you really described a local problem. You're, you're probably, you know, wasting effort. When I talk about the, um, you know, operational efficiency, I think you're realizing, oh, wait a minute, maybe we need a better way of routing questions, you know, um, limiting, you know, the number of email addresses that are on a staff contact list or making it very, very clear that you should use the reference form if you want to have your reference, qu you know, question answered the most efficiently. Um, you know, so you can avoid this sort of, you know, duplication of, of, uh, of effort. Um, but um, again, yeah, local practice. If you're spending time answering it, I think as you know, as, as Emily said, yeah, count the time. Uh, but maybe you do want to change your practice as as a result of what you're learning, and that's that's what assessment's all about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you know that if it's the same topic, the same requester, that's that was one reference question, no matter who worked on it, and that's something they have to internally figure out how to realize that, notice it when the stats are being take collected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another question came in, just popped up. Uh, all right, this is a long one, I'll just read it. Um, regarding events, are you intending to include only events hosted and sponsored by the repository or any events where the repository is involved? The definition seems to suggest the former, but there are examples about broadcasts and talks for community associations. What about joint events? For example, three repositories collaborate on an outreach event. It takes staff time and showcases collections, but it's officially hosted by the Regional Archives Association. So what are your events definitions, I suppose, would be the specific question. Well, let's see. We, um, I guess I'll pick up here, Christian, again. Um, we... We tried to, you know, work with, we adapted uh, ISO 2789, um, .229 event definition, um, you know, that it's a prearranged activity uh, with cultural, educational, social, political, scholarly, or other intent. Um, you know, that's, that's the, uh, then there's also another uh, definition in the uh, ANSI and ISO Z397 standard about information services to groups. Uh, information contacts planned in advance in which a staff member or a person invited by a staff member provides information intended for a number of persons. Um, and then it kind of goes on from there. So in this case, we adapted our definition to, uh, again, reflect so that we are, are still kind of speaking the same language as um, these other standards um, and yet reflect uh, what is you know, a repository practice we, that we've observed. So we define an event as a prearranged activity with cultural, educational, social, political, scholarly, or other intent, such as tours, lectures, concerts, and other programs. And we do say organized or hosted by the repository. So um, if you are providing a venue space uh, for, uh, for an event, then uh, even if you are not directly involved in it, um, then that still counts as an event. Um, this is interesting. The Nebraska Library Consortium or Commission is hosting a uh, this webinar. Is that an event um, by our definition because it's being hosted uh, online? It is a prearranged activity. It has some um, what's called educational intent to it. Um, so I guess by that definition, we could. It would be a matter of local practice whether you're including um, you know online events like that. Uh, anyone else want to comment? Amy, um, Emily, I'm trying to. Remember, we've had some discussion about this, but um, I don't have that part of the. I'm looking at the definition right now and not uh, what we actually um, amend in terms of guidelines for collection here. I'm going to skip back to that now. Yeah, it seems like well, the question had some element to it about um, the sort of collaboration, right? Um, and I think right. that's an well, it, point. I think it could be for any sort of thing. Is it, does it have to be? only hosted, sponsored by your own repository or supposing there's other ones involved or you did a community, a, a joint thing with uh, some other ones, yeah. Because there's so many different yeah, I mean, with, possibilities, with, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. With reference to our definition, I would, I would say, you know, that that is something that is organized by, a rep by your repository, then, you know, it counts as your event. I mean, that also means that it counts as you know, repository B's event and repository C's event. Um, but if you're collaborating to do that, that that makes sense within the, the bounds of, of the definition we've provided. Um, what's interesting to me is maybe this idea of collaboration and of tracking that in some way, which has come up around um, 
instructional activity too as a question of do we want to be capturing that as maybe some kind of um, advanced measure, which I think is maybe an open question. Uh, Krishna again here, as Emily's been speaking, I've been going back through the document a little bit. We, um, this is an area, so this is a useful comment. We could probably clarify this and make, make it uh, clear when we talk about um, events and the initial basic measure um, that we do mean to include broadcast kind of events, right? This actually should, we do give this as a guideline for collection under an advanced measure for what we call event attendees. You know, and there we say for online events such as webcasts, count the number of viewers as event attendees. Okay, so we are recognizing that, you know, um, an event may be, you know, this uh, this online uh, event here. Okay, so um, we can make that clearer in our definitions uh, earlier in the uh, in that in that domain section. I think um, would be a good thing to do. Let's see. But um, you know, to Emily's point too, it's 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 so long as the information, you know, this is where it's like operational impacts we're talking about here, the inputs and outputs again, right? If your if your repository facilities or staff are in some way providing a resource, you know, your resources are going to hosting that event, even though you're not one of the you know speakers in it. Um, you know, that's that's an impact. Now that's where you know our basic measures aren't going to tell you a whole lot how many events did you have or were were they broadcasts were they you know they lectures were they attended by a lot of people that's where yeah, you to have a true kind of assessment area you need to take multiple measures and combine them into some type of story um, and that's where this idea of time we have that with events too how much staff time has gone into preparing events so if your staff is not is just simply hosting a, a webinar you probably record, you know, relatively little staff time involvement in that uh, in that uh, in that broadcast. Whereas if you are producing the whole show, you know, then that would show up there. So that's where you might have, you know, in, in one case, repository A has five events and repository B has five events. But if you look at the time that each of you know was spent in it, repository A invested a lot of time because they produced, you know, three broadcasts and um, you know and two lecture series that were held at their repository. Um, Whereas you know, repository B simply you know opened its uh, seminar room to uh, to local community groups to use it for an event. Okay, um, it's still an event that happened at the repository, but you can see you know when you start combining those measures that you get a different story of, of uh, both operational inputs and then outputs that come from it. Okay, thank you. Um, Anybody have any last minute urgent questions? It's about 10 after, so I think it probably is about time to wrap things up. Um, um, okay, somebody did just type something in looking for, got more, oh, they got more clarification about our previous question. Do the standards recommend checkout counts, um, but not collections, names of collections specifically? Uh, correct. So that's uh, that's one of our definitions. We 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 have as a as a checkout, which actually corresponds to what you know. Um, we have a kind of funny definition to it: the act of recording the removal of a collection unit. Again, piggybacking definitions from its place of storage, so that it may be issued to what we call a registered user in a reading room or for some other purpose. So we do, yes, absolutely. You know, try to crisply define what a checkout is um, and then encourage people as, again, a statistical quantitative standard to count checkouts. Um, we do give in our application of examples, yes, it's, it's interesting if you can, in whatever system you're capturing those checkouts, you know, if you have a, an online system where you're capturing the title along with, you know, the call number and everything else about the item as a checkout, great, then you can actually maybe sort that report and group titles together and say, huh, that, that collection gets a lot of use. Um, and, and that can help your digitization thing. So, um, so that's where the, 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 the data capture method, um, again, will help you to give you the data that you can do things with. Um, but again, our, our baseline is we want to come up with measures so that if you only have a, you know, a sheet of paper and a pencil, you should still be able to, um, um, you know, to, to, to track even, these, uh, even some of the advanced measures that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
and this is Amy, and so I'll just mention this, the basic measure, all checkouts, again, you see there that it includes registered users who are in the reading room, but also relates to other user services. So you're helping someone, you know, via email, you're doing a reproduction, an exhibition loan, or an ILL, those are all under all checkouts. And then with the uh, more advanced measures, th those other uses, potential uses, get broken out. So you can count those separately. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can see that there, yeah. yeah. All right. All right, I think we'll wrap it up now since it is now about 12 after. <laughs> um, if you guys do have any other questions, of course, um, Amy, Christian, and Emily, your information is there. They've, they've provided their, their contact info with the slides, and um, they'll, they'll be looking for comments on the website, too, on those links. So um, those will also be included when we um, give you the recording info. So please do reach out to them with any questions and anything else you do want to know about it. Um, February 17th, right? That's the deadline? That's right. What next you're looking Friday. for? Yeah, next Friday. So you still got a week and a half or so to get um, some input into this. Yeah. All right. Any last minute things you guys want to say before I do wrap it up? Thank you. thank you to everyone for coming, and we look yes. forward to your comments. All right. All right. Great. Thank you, um, Amy and Emily and Christian. Um, I'm going to pull back to my screen now. Um, as I said, yes, the show uh, is waiting for it to come up there. There we go. Um, we um, have recorded the show, are recording the show still, <laughs> um, and it will be available on our website. Um, on our Encompass Live website here, which I'm showing you now. This is a specific um, entry for today. And you see here the links here that are for the asking for the comments are all the hot links here will be included when you get the recording information as well. Um, this is our Encompass Live main website. Uh, luckily, you can just Google Encompass Live. And so far, we're the only thing called that. So um, you uh, search for us anywhere, you'll come up with it. It's uh, on, on here is our upcoming shows, but then right here is where the archives will be right beneath the um, upcoming topics. And um, yours will be listed right above here. And we will have, this one had some documents. The recording will be available. And um, if you send me the presentation, Amy, I can put it up on here. And links to those sites for um, putting in your comments will be available. And I'll email everyone who attended and registered uh, after this is processed. Probably later this afternoon it should be ready. I'm um, usually as I'm at the mercy of YouTube, but generally they do think things come through pretty quickly. Um, so look for that email later today. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is Tween and Teen Build Collective. This is from Lindsay Tomsu, who is uh, the teen coordinator at our La Vista Public Library here in La Vista, Nebraska. She's got this um, build collective that she put together. She's a, the teen coordinator there. She does a lot of great things with her teens and even the long, younger tweens. Um, She's going to come on the show next week to tell us about what they've been doing lately. So hope you'll sign up for that and any of our other upcoming shows. You see we've got some, our February ones and some of our March, always adding new ones to the schedule. So do look for when the other March ones are, are fi finalized and posted. Um, also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, you could pop over to our Facebook page and give us a like here. Follows up. I post items um, when we're um, ready. You can log in on the fly. I post in the reminder messages. I post recordings on here. So anything um, related to the show, we post it on our page. So if you're big on Facebook, you want to track what we're doing from over there, go ahead and give us a like. Other than that, that does wrap it up for today's show. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to our speakers for coming in locally and remotely. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Hello.